Welcome to Asian Investors Network, where we help our community prosper and achieve their financial goals. Let's begin. The elephant in the room is the interest rate hikes, which have been pretty aggressive from the Federal Reserve. The interest rates have gone up significantly since the start of the year. So how does that affect people's strategy here? I'm going to play the uh, the polarizing side and say, are the interest rates really such a big deal? I hear a lot from like older folks and my parents or my parents' friends, they would say stuff like, hey, used to be like, I don't know, 8, 10% at some point in our lives. Why are you guys worried about 5%? Just kind of wanted to throw that out there as a polarizing perspective. I guess I would ask kind of like a deflective question um, as to like, how does the interest rate impact house value. What I have been noticing recently, um, just from a personal experience, I'm always out there looking for new deals. Recently, I didn't notice that there's there's some level of price correction, right, to the house value. And um, typically what I do is if there's an increase in interest rate, I would actually bake that into my model. Um, and then I just have to reduce the aggressiveness in terms of how much I'm willing to pay, right, for that specific property. You know, even though the interest rate's been climbing, like I've been buying property since it was like, you know, 4% up to like, at this point, it's pretty crazy. Like the last time I check, um, 30 year fix was around 6.3% for investment properties. Um, so I kind of opted into like a 10 year arm, which kind of brings down the rate to 5.5. And then, you know, you factor, you, you factor that right. In addition to all the foreseeable expenses. And then, um, you know, with the lower cost and property value it actually works out very similarly, um, surprisingly, in terms of like the cash on cash return or the cap rate. Um, so it didn't really impact things as much, right? Um, because there are less, there's definitely been a lot less competition and it also helped drives down the house value. Um, so it, it didn't, it, it actually didn't change things too materially at least, you know, not to the degree that I would imagine um, it would have an impact on like, you know, the ability to buy houses or whatnot. I think these are some good points that have been made. So what Gary said in terms of like the historical context of federal funds rate, um, I was just looking at an article prior to this. And if you look at federal funds rate, it's been as high as 6%. Um, that's, you know, I, I don't know if anybody was investing then. I, I wasn't, but... Um, Historically, you know, it's it's been pretty high. Um, I guess the counter to that, and then right now it's still looking at the past 10, 20 years, still relatively low, right? But I guess the the counter to that is what has happened to home values or um, you know, property value since that time period 20 years ago, right? Um, you know, uh, has has have properties in in the cities increased by twenty percent, thirty percent, two hundred percent, right? So, um, has there been a equivalent balance in the values compared with interest rates? Um, so that's kind of an interesting comparison. Um, I think as far as yeah, how it's affecting the market. So I I, I take Will's perspective in terms of. This is one input in the model, right? So when your interest rate was 4%, 3.5% a year, two years ago, that's what you punch in, right? For us, um, we're looking at deals, you know, all the time uh, under contract on one right now. Um, you know, it's, it's 41 units and we were very nervous about the market. So for us, luckily so far, we have not, we have not done any floating rate. So there's zero floating rate um, in our portfolio right now, um, not planning to do any floating rate. And that's the stuff that, you know, might cause some problems. Uh, and for, you know, for background, if people don't know what floating rate means, that just means that it's not fixed. So as the federal, as the Fed raises rates by 50 points, 75 points, that just means your rate goes from five to six or seven or whatever it is. And you might have to buy like a cap, more reserves, et cetera. With buyers kind of pulling back with these rates, there could be an opportunity. Um, and it's probably market specific. I'm, I'm curious what people think and are seeing in their markets. But, um, you know, you might see like a, a wider bid ask spread. You know, sellers just, they might want to hold on and say, you know, I don't care if buyers are not giving me the price. I'll just hold on to it. You know, you've got 
record high occupancy, rents are still going up, um, performance on NOI is still pretty good. So, um, and then, you know, it might be as, as buyers pull back, that might be an opportunity for people who are still in the market, right, to, to be making offers. So a question for those who are kind of on the front lines in terms of like selling real estate or buying it at higher volumes. Are you seeing a discrepancy between what the buyers want and what the sellers are looking for? And is there like more hesitation in the market overall? There's definitely a very... Uh obvious hesitation right now like open houses has been slow a lot you know used to be 60 parties in like uh, a day right now you're lucky if you get like four it's a huge uh decline in interest hey gene when you talk about that um that decline what region are you talking about just out of curiosity cupertino sunnyvale I can speak to it from like a vacation market perspective. So I have short-term rentals in the Smoky Mountains that's in um, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and also Broken Bow. So those are considered vacation markets for folks and I'm putting it on Airbnb. Um, definitely seeing a slow decline in pricing. So just for reference, a four bedroom during the COVID or the peak of COVID, it was selling anywhere from like 900K to million. Um, now, if you're pulling up Redfin in the Smokies, you're seeing it decline down to around like 800, 700-ish. Um, and now you can also easily pick up like a two bedroom for like 500 to 600, which was pretty unheard of before 2022. Um, in terms of Broken Bow, that's much more of like a luxury vacation market. So prices are still staying strong there. Um, I'm still seeing two bedrooms anywhere, eight to 900K, four bedrooms, million and above. Um, but similar to Jean's sentiment, uh, definitely lower demand higher supply. Um, and I think like just to tie it back to your original question, Sam, in terms of like, how are we pivoting with interest rates? I think as an investor, like we've seen these type of interest rates before. I think for the past two years, we've just kind of had our cake and eat it too, which is like this nice icing of like 3% interest rate. I think moving forward, depending on if you're in long-term or short-term strategy, it's just kind of how you pivot and how you redo your formula. Um, I personally don't see myself stopping in terms of acquiring for short-term rental, but I might be pivoting my strategy to more of like a midterm rental where I'm targeting nurses versus traveling like vacation market or being more metro versus going into like the wood or the beach market for the time being. So for, for the short-term side, you know, you're, you're seeing prices drop, um, which may, maybe that's, maybe that's a good opportunity to, you know, keep staying active there. But what about the, like the renter demand? You said you're pivoting a little bit or, you know, are people kind of tightening a little bit in terms of the vacation demand? I know the Smokies is like, I don't know, number one STR market in the country. Just yeah. curious how that's looking. Yeah, great question. It's funny because if you're like a part of the Smoky Mountains investor group, you'll see like a ton of hosts just been like freaking out, like where is the demand and like everything is dropping. Um, but personal perspective, I just feel like it really depends. There's just so many principles and factors that goes into like how you uh, fill up the occupancy for your cabins or just your short term rental. So it could be around like, is it factors like is it modern? Is it based on how people want to choose cabins now in terms of like, do they want more of a traditional feel or do they want more of like a modern hipster feel in the cabin? And then the other piece of that too is, is that host doing direct marketing or direct booking? So there's just like a lot of levers that you can pull. Um, but in terms of demand, so for June, I actually had 93% occupancy, like I've been pretty booked, but I know for other cabin owners, they're struggling. Um, and there's just so many things and principles that goes into it. I don't know what that might be. Um, but for me personally, it's continuously tweaking like my description, uh, signing up for Rank Breeze just to see where I'm ranking on a daily basis, making small tweaks, changing my price range here and there, and just applying discounts or taking it out uh, month over month just to get that boosting on the listing. I hope that answered your question. Sorry, that was a mouthful. <laughs> No, no, thanks for that. Very, very helpful to hear the perspective and, you know, good job to you for, you know, adapting and it sounds like the occupancy is still pretty good. So that's, uh, that's definitely a good thing. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Gary, to answer your question, the 
Oh, it w it's called Rank Breeze. I'll type it in. Basically, what it is is um, if you sign up for that service, you can enter in your Airbnb URL, and it will run data around how your listing is doing in terms of like views and how it's being ranked um, on the Airbnb page. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would also add on top, it sounds like the uh, secret sauce is being able to really like be, be really good at promoting your property as a, like that will differentiate you with all of the other renters. Yeah, definitely. I think that too. And I think just overall, like how active you are as a host, because like when you're leaving reviews or you're commenting and like replying, that definitely boosts you up versus a listing where I know Airbnb dings you if you just kind of set it and forget it. Um, so for any other hosts out there, like even the smallest thing, like tweaking your title every three days or just changing around like your photo from order number one to order number three, those little things help. It picks up the trade. It sounds like the name of the game is adaptation and really pivoting to make sure that you're on top of the market. Yeah, you have to really do that uh, in this type of market. Uh, and, and even if it wasn't like this, Sam, you have just uh, the whole... STR thing, you have to be willing to pivot. And it's it's a different mindset from long-term. Uh, so, I mean, unless you've been doing short-term, I think it's a little harder for like that mindset to kind of wrap it around where you're like, oh yeah, I've got just prices. I've got to, you know, maybe like pivot to midterm um, or look at other possibilities like Tracy said. Um, and you know, do direct, you know, like do direct marketing and kind of push out. Um, keep on this kind of. It's a little, I would say, a little more work in long term, but uh, the the outcome and the benefits way more than what you get long term uh, in terms of cash flow. <clears throat> Just in general, I've been seeing the slowdown. Um, one of my best units here in Burbank, California. I think it's just due to what you know what we've seen. Um, not only interest rates, but higher gas, higher fuel. So those two things alone are going to impact travel to you know local and international, like you know state to state, and then uh, a bunch of international traffic still hasn't come to U.S. Really hasn't come to U.S. I mean, like. I'm pretty sure, like Tracy could tell you, like there's not a lot of international travel coming through. But I've only seen maybe like five guests this year from international um, versus like 2019 or 2020, like you know before 2020, the whole pandemic thing happened. So, I once I think once we get through this, you know, little bump, it'll it'll be back to where we are. Uh, are we going to see like last year where it was a huge surge? I don't think so right away, but once international opens back up, I'll, I expect a surge of travel. When do you think that is? And because uh, I don't really follow up with like world economics or like how things are going in terms of how everything is uh, it's, opening up and stuff. But what do you think? And <laughs> it's tough to say because it's each country is a little bit different. So it, it really just depends on on how how strict they still are with everything, with you know, with COVID, with you know, doing PCRs and you know, doing tests and all that. Because I know, like, you know, China is still locked down. So and they're doing. I think they went back to like fourteen day lockdowns. So it's just things like that, you know, are hampering international travel. And here in LA, that's a big segment of international travel that, you know, even even San Francisco, you've got a huge influx of Asian travelers, international business travelers um, before the pandemic ever happened. And when's that going to open, reopen? It's hard to say, you know, it depends on the country and depends on the, what, what's going on. Is there a new variant? You know, is there you know, um, something that's going to affect it? And I, you know, if everything stays the same, I think uh, I, I think we could see 2023. Cool. Actually, um, I have a quick question, like not to beat a dead horse, um, but I have mostly been in investing in like long-term rentals. I've always been super curious about how short-term rental works, right? Especially there are a lot more um, 
things to consider, like in terms of, you know, upkeeping it, managing it, seasonality. Um, there's a lot of different things that come into play. Um, Tracy, would you be able to share a little bit more in terms of like what is, you know, what is the average return for short-term rental compared to say long-term yeah. when you factor all of those things into consideration? Yeah, great question. Um, I think like all folks, when they jump into a deal, it just really depends on like where you anchor your cash on cash return. Um, for me, for short term rental, my anchor was going into an investment with a 20% cash on cash or above. Um, and happy to say like both of my short term rentals are tracking towards that and potentially going above. So really happy with that. So definitely the returns for short term is going, I'm seeing like three or four X uh, versus the long term uh, that I'm netting. However, that being said, um, the work that goes into short term is also three or four X of that. So in terms of management, um, you have two options. It's either you hire a property manager, which for short term rental will take anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of your profit every month. Or you can do what I do, and I believe Erwin does this too, is self-management. Um, and then there are going to be like CRM and software like owner res or guesty that you can sign up for to help you automate a lot of like the guest communication um, and even tools for you to set pricing. Um, but I would say most of the heavy lifting is in the beginning stages of setting it up where you have to be physically there to set it up furniture, all that good stuff, interview your like um, cleaners, etc. Or um, if you want to be a little bit more hands off, you can definitely hire for that as well. Um, but all in all, um, again, just depends on the cash on cash that you're looking for. But work wise, I do want to give you a fair warning that there is going to be a lot more like activeness on your end versus a long term. It was great. I love my long term in Ohio. I found the property, found a great PM and she's running in and I barely touch or do anything. And I'm just getting a check versus with Airbnb. It's like even after it's done, you're still managing like day to day guest communication. Um, so it's a lot of like, do you have the appetite to be a host and to cater to your guests every single time they check in and out? You know, I, I guess I wonder if, is it more um, profitable to do a short-term rental? Because I would imagine that, you know, you're probably not going to get occupancy all the time. And so, you know, my guess, I haven't done a short-term, but my guess it's about the same uh, returns if you do a long-term, but uh, you know, wanted to get your take on that. Like, it just seems like there's some, you know, there's some benefit that I haven't fully grokked yet. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think based on the numbers that I'm seeing, I would argue it's like five or 10 X higher than long-term because for a short-term rental, you're renting out on a daily basis. So again, it depends on the market that you're in and the gases that you're targeting. So for example, with like my broken boat cabin, I'm targeting a luxury market. So I'm charging for a two bedroom anywhere from like 400 to $500 a day. And you can kind of do the math if I'm doing 90% occupancy um, versus like if I'm in a different market, maybe a four bedroom is going for like a two or 300. Um, so you can kind of see where like the market definitely plays a factor in how you price it. But all in all, if you are confident in the market and you can get to like a certain occupancy, um, when I'm doing my underwriting, I always anchor for like a 60% occupancy with a 20% cash on cash. And if those numbers make sense, then I make the decision to jump for it. But your occupancy rate could be different based on kind of like your appetite of at the end of the day, how much do I want to make passively a month um, off of this property? Got it. Right. Yeah. So, so Tracy, you mentioned that 20% cash on cash return, right? That is based on the assumption that you, you're taking a more proactive sort of approach in the process. Like you're, you know, running a lot of the day-to-day -day yourself. Yeah, correct. So I am fully self-managing both of the properties myself. Um, the only property that I have a PM for is a long-term rental. Um, and again, I like I played around with the numbers and it just doesn't make sense to have a PM at this point unless I scale up to like five short term rentals, then it's just there's no way. <laughs> but for now, it's like if you can definitely try to do it, it is doable. Um, I have a W2, so we can definitely do it. It just takes a little bit more time, but I think it's definitely worth it. Gotcha. And then I, I think this is like a, more of a follow up question for the broader group, right? Like what is 
what is what is a good like cash on cash return for long term rentals based on what you guys are seeing today? Gene, do you have any insights on this one or Wakefield? Uh, mine's kind of skewed. What I mean is that like I built ADU, right? So um, cash on cash on ADU, like the amount of money you put into ADU is probably usually 20 to 25 percent. But that's given that you have a house already. So it's a different, uh, different story. I had a question for, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to make a quick joke. I was like, maybe you could help build some ADUs behind my long-term <laughs> rental property. <laughs> sure. Are you, are you in the Bay? <laughs> no, I'm not. My houses are in areas that don't allow ADUs, unfortunately. But um, otherwise, I would definitely ring you up when I come across opportunities like that. Sounds pretty amazing. Thank you. Yeah, um, if you're in the Bay, like I'm glad to give you like some insights. You know, that's all. Yep, G Gary is thinking about it. So maybe, maybe Gary, you and Gene can connect and learn more about it. Yeah, actually, yeah, let's connect. I have a uh, a property in Sunnyvale that you know has a large backyard, and I wanted to do the math on whether the ADU can get me um, more returns. So let's connect. Sunnyville, eh? That's great. That's a great location. No, honestly, no joke. Not being uh, sarcastic or anything. That, that's like the best bang for your buck area. You get really high rents there. It's, it's pretty good. I wish I did not sell my Sunnyville property as a flip. Should have just held on to it. <laughs> Can Eugene, I call? High, high size, high size 2020, man. And also, sure. like, uh, price has been dropping. So you should be glad that you don't have that anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's been dropping a lot. Can I actually ask, um, it's Wakefield, right? Am I saying, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you mentioned your, um, was it like a 20 unit you said or 40? Uh, yeah, we're on our contract on 41 right now. Um, our total portfolio is about close to 200. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, what we look at kind of varies in terms of size, but yeah, go ahead. You had a question. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Congrats. I just like to piggyback on Will's question. Like, how are you underwriting those numbers and like, what's kind of your cash on cash, um, like target when you're looking at renting it per unit? Yeah, I was going to share a little bit about the numbers. Uh, it's, uh, it's not 20. So good job to <laughs> you and, and the short term renters who are, are getting 20. That's amazing. Um, so, I mean, what, what we like to target, I would say is, um, it, it depends how we buy it. Right. So for us, we're, we're value add investors. So, um, you know, we don't really buy stabilized, you know, B or A properties at like a five, six cap where usually buying something that needs work. Right. So we need to, um, you know, fix up the interiors and, um, take care of deferred maintenance and stuff like that. But, um, I'd say our going in cap rate. So meaning at purchase, what do we get? You know, day one is somewhere around targeting like six to eight, I would say. And then when it's stabilized, um, you know, I'd say like eight to 10 plus. And so one of the things is, and I think you can do this with short-term rentals too, is a refinance. So, um, you know, we'd aim to, to do the value add within, you know, 24 to 36 months, do a refinance, pull out some funds and pay the investors back. And then that would increase the cash on cash return. You, usually we're targeting something like double digit. Um, and in terms of rent, so our market, our focus market right now is uh, is Ohio. Uh, I heard, I heard, you know, I think someone else invests there also. Um, we have a property in Texas and mostly in Ohio now, just because the cash flow is, is better. Um, so, you know, on a one bedroom, that could be, you know, six, $700, um, on a two bedroom, you can get, um, yeah, I'd say like seven, 800, uh, per, per unit and, and it varies, right? So we are mainly in like the C, you know, C plus B minus type of range. Um, if you do a, and this depends on like city location, you know, all kinds of things, but if you do a, that could be, you know, 800 to, you know, if we're talking about the newest product, it's probably, I think rents are like 1500 to 1700 you know, which, you know, if you guys are in the Bay Area, that's like, it's like a killer deal still. 
but um, you know that's that's kind of probably peak in that area. Does that does that answer that? Yeah, that did answer that. And then just a quick follow up, like with labor and material shortages, are you seeing like a pretty bad setback on any of the units that you're trying to add value to, or like how are you uh, combating that? Yeah, yeah, good question. So um, labor, labor is a challenge, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people know what's going on with supply chain and you know ordering inventory and stuff like that just takes a long time. So um, you know we we try to do planning in advance um, in terms of when we acquire deals. We bought I think maybe five or six deals this year, so um, it's been you know kind of kind of a handful, and so now we are. Um, I think kind of refocusing and especially with the interest rates going up and making sure that we're not buying, you know, faster or more than we can handle with our, with our crew. Um, so we have management in place that's been there for a couple of years. Um, and then we also have started to build out our, our database of just other contractors. So GCs or plumbers or roofers, just so we have a backup buffer. Um, in case, you know, our internal team can't, can't handle some of the, um, the repairs, but, um, yeah, I, I'd say, you know, rates are going up and, you know, even just gas prices, er, you know, inflation is, is hitting everybody. Got it. Thank you. Hey, well, Wakefield, uh, I have a question. So, um, do you, for, for your Ohio, um, apartments uh do, do you syndicate uh yeah so so far um you know we've been doing this for a couple of years we've we mostly grown the portfolio through jvs um this year we're starting to open up to syndications um on on some of our opportunities i would say you know probably 50 or 100 plus unit type um that would that we you know do the work and get the syndication attorney and and present some opportunities but um we haven't we haven't done one yet but you know we kind of know how it works um know a fair number of people that do it but um you know we'll we're planning to have some of those opportunities of course you know pending market conditions sometime you know this this or next year sounds we, good i'll ask sam for the info hey, i got a question about the syndications for folks here uh, when you do a syndication for the real estates do you also get to do the tax write-offs Yes, you get tax depreciation benefits um, that will show up on your K-1s. So like very similar to a long-term rental, right? Like for a long-term, you know, I um, any like improvements and depreciation I get to write off. It's like a similar concept for syndications. Yeah, so uh, syndications are going to be classified as passive income. I'm not an accountant or a CPA, just uh, speaking off of what I've generally observed. Um, but Syndications, you, you get a K-1 and then you get some depreciation benefit, uh, for example, passive losses, even though you're receiving distributions. There's eventually some sort of depreciation recapture upon uh, a sale. Got it. Sam, just curious, are you doing um, like accelerated de depreciation cost setting on, on your uh, projects? Yeah, we, we do uh, uh, cost seg on some projects if uh, we feel like it's warranted. Uh, a lot of times it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, so speaking of uh, supply chain shortages and, and labor issues, how is everyone managing that? You mean the cost wise? Yeah, uh, I mean, um, managing your inventory and uh, getting certain like materials or appliances and things like that. Yeah, it, it all went up. So, I mean, you have to bite the bullet. I mean, it sucks. Um, I think it's definitely a slowdown and just like delivery time. I think it's just like across the board ever since November, but it's not that bad because I ordered stuff when I was in escrow. So we were able to get it by the time uh, we were ready to launch. Honestly, from my experience, I had to, I had to source a lot harder for stuff that I need to buy, um, especially when you're when you, you know when you're managing rentals that are out of state, right? And you try to order something on Best Buy. It's either they don't have it in stock or you're going to get it a few months from now, right? Obviously, you can't keep the house vacant for a couple of months. So you have to kind of resort to other vendors or maybe other options, right, that are not the most ideal choices. Um, it's definitely been a challenge. And like one thing that I have started um, to do a little bit more on is 
kind of um, do a little bit more like price comparison. Like some vendors just charge you ridiculous prices to do any sort of maintenance work. Um, and I find that Thumbstack um, to be a pretty decent place in terms of like, you know, being able to get reasonable rate to get certain things done. Like when it comes to maintenance or, you know, servicing your house or fixing certain things, right, for compliancy or, you know, rental certificate purposes in some states. Um, that that seems to have helped reduce like some of my costs, right? To 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 get some of the investment properties ready um, and servicing them, you know, on a regular basis. And a lot of times, once you find a good vendor, they charge a reasonable rate. Um, you can always, you know, keep in touch with them, right, and continue using their services. Um, but yeah, there's been a lot of vendors that charge ridiculous prices these days. It's pretty insane. Yeah, and I would even say like when it comes to material, it's kind of like what's the opportunity cost of you waiting two months just to get something like $100 cheaper versus paying a premium now and just get it up and running. Um, I'm Asian. I grew up Asian. <laughs> always will be. And so it's kind of like that discount is always just so attractive. But when you think about it from a, like a long term perspective, it's kind of like, especially if you're trying to launch an Airbnb, it's like, no, I need this now because I want my guests in tomorrow versus like in two months. So I agree. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, the, the downtime wouldn't be worth it, but I definitely hear you on the Asian and wanting a discount. <laughs> This was a great audience to say that to, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Pivoting their strategy in, in the next six months, a year or, or so, like what, what do you think is some things that you would avoid and some things that you think might be attractive? Annie, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I know you got your finger on the pulse, a lot of investors. Oh, exactly right. Just kidding. Um, I think I'm still going to do what I'm continuing to do on. But um, I might be looking, be more aggressive in when offering is just to um, request more for a discount. And then if the numbers still work out for long term, I think I'm still going to buy as long as, you know, at least I break even their cash flow. But I don't think I'm going to be as aggressive because I don't want to over leverage myself. But still buy. And then maybe um, two years later, whatever, if the rates to go down, then I'll go cash out refi, lower the rate a bit and just make myself more comfortable with it. Anyone else have any thoughts on uh, their strategy for the next 12 months or so? I'm curious what uh, your strategy is, Sam, or your uh, your company, if you can share. Yeah, sure. Um, so we are, we, we've been doing a pivot into affordable housing for the past um, few years. And I think that market is extremely resistant to any sort of like pullback or recessions. Um, historically, it's been probably the safest uh, commercial real estate asset class. Uh, so we, we target uh, properties with over 100 units and uh, we have you know, developers who are able to achieve and get their, their bond allocation um, because it's, it's very complex to, to navigate the regulatory, legal and compliance um, issues that come with affordable housing. Uh, but it also comes with, you know, uh, certain tax benefits for investors. Um, those those returns are actually uh, tax free for what we're doing. So, I think that is a strategy that my firm is pursuing. And there's certain other types of um, commercial assets that I think will be a good performer uh, during these times. We we think that uh, valuations will start to come down for things like multifamily. Uh, but there's still a lot of demand for industrial, like things like uh, last mile distribution centers, uh, data centers, film, film studios, things like that. Um, they're all very strong, uh, same with self-storage. Self Just following up, um, so you guys are either developing or partnering with developers, and is it, um, is it LIHTC, like tax credit? Yeah, yeah, we do some uh, uh, LIHTC. We, we don't run the operations ourselves. We, we partner with uh, developers with you know, the strong track record, or it could be a substantial value add uh, type of play. Um, okay. We just have to require enough capital for us to deploy. And for development right now, um, kind of seeing in the market with the slowdown that some developers are 
are pulling back, just hesitant about demand and interest rates, costs to develop, and you know, hitting their return on cost numbers. Are are the developers, you know, do do you guys have any perspectives on still developing or continue yeah. to develop at the same pace or finishing your projects or? Right, um, that's a good question. I think we will definitely see. Uh, tons of developers pulling back and um, wondering if they've over leveraged or uh, <laughs> struggling to deliver because of the um, labor issues and the supply side issues. Um, I think for affordable, it's very insulated because you know um, you you have that built in um, uh, government financing, and also people aren't going to stop into affordable because it's the cheapest. Uh, rents on the block. So I, I think that's okay. I think that I would be wary of like new projects for say luxury developments. I would definitely be more conservative on all the projections, at least for the next few years. I, I think it could be a good time to look at acquiring properties that are struggling or underperforming um, for people who may have overextended. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing. I know a lot of us are in different types of investing, like Wakefield and I are in commercial, Tracy's and Erwin are in uh, STRs, jeans and long-term rent. What, what is your outlook? Really interesting to see this format. This is my first uh, AIN call ever, so thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, I'm based out of New York. The reason why I came onto this was uh, really from a residential perspective, because I always feel like New York and maybe SF, it's like, uh, super extremes where let's say uh, you get a one bedroom here for 4,800 or 4,200, um, but the now uh, the landlord wants 500 bucks and 500 bucks more. And so how do you negotiate that? Um, and, and so people are renewing their leases for $500 more or they're moving out, but then realizing they can't really afford, you know, whatever place they're looking at next. And then they're kind of moving out of the city then. Um, and then from a buying perspective, it's, you know, I bought something uh, during COVID at a COVID discount, like a studio apartment, 700K. Um, and that's like the cheapest studio here in, in Manhattan. So it's a different ballgame, I feel. Um, and from an investment perspective, I don't think it was a good investment. But for New York, it was really good because uh, I locked in 2.37% 30-year fixed, 20% down. But I don't see, you know, property rates going up like 7% a year for me to double my money in 10 years. It's just impossible. But so as long as I can rent it out for 3100 that covers the carrying costs and I can try to up it more, um, then I think it's, uh, it's fine for the next 5, 10 years. That's just my quick uh, New York City uh, take. Sounds like the New York market is a lot like California, very high numbers. It's not easy to make it work, but it can be really good for appreciation. GC Yang, how, how about you? What is your strategy in real estate? Oh, I was I actually just came to ask a question because Gary pinged me this link and I had just ironically been asking him uh, nice. this question. Um, and uh, so for between arm and fixed, what's your strategy there? Well, I think you recently uh, did an arm over a fixed, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm actually closing on a deal right now, um, doing a 10 arm um, because there's like a 1%. So basically I was quoted like a 6.5% rate with one point um, versus like a 5.5, right? Um, for a 10 year arm. And for me, I am kind of sort of projecting, well, I mean, first of all, I think the interest rate is kind of high, right? Like not super high yet, but it's kind of high. And um, second, I'm actually projecting that, you know, within the ten, ten, next 10 years, um, there will be an opportunity for me to do a refinance. So um, I took a 5.5 rate, no point, um, versus like a 6.5, 30 year fix with point. So you don't think it's gonna go up any, at any time in the next 10? Um, I think that there, I mean, it's just like my, my prediction, right? Um, again, like I'm always wrong, but I think that within the next 10 years, there would be an opportunity where the 30 year fixed rate might come down below 6.5% for me to do a refinance. Well, if you don't mind okay. me asking, is that like a 20 down? 
Uh, 25. 25. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, is it an interest only loan for the first 10 years? Uh, no, um, it's actually, yeah, it's actually like principal plus interest. So it just kind of works out like, you know, any sort of like fixed rate loans. But yeah, I mean, I, I think, it. you know, kind of ties back to like the opportunity piece. I think that there's still a lot of opportunities. Like, you know, when I started buying some of these investment uh, properties, it, they're, they're kind of like, you know, mainly two approach that I've been discussing um, with a lot of folks about, you know, when it comes to residential kind of like rental property investing, it's like one, it's like, okay, you can invest in areas that's up and coming, but your cash flow is going to be really poor, right? It's, it's either you're lucky to break even, um, if not, sometimes you might be operating at a loss, like renting out the property. Um, but then, you know, the bigger bet is that the appreciation is going to be so much more substantial, right? Than some of the other areas with better cash flow, but like slower appreciation. Um, so what I have been doing, like when I have been buying properties in like Pennsylvania and also Michigan, um, is that I really just focus on a cash on cash aspect, um, given that I'm thinking that the recession might be coming and especially with inflation actually helps drive up the rental rate. Um, the cash on cash return portion is actually, you know, the reason why I asked the question, like, hey, what is, what is a good, like, um, cash on cash return, right, for short term uh, investment properties. Um, and basically what I have been getting so far, um, is somewhere between 15 to 18%, right, on the long term rental. So um, I was just trying to figure out, okay, am I coming in good, bad, or am I actually doing, you know, okay, right? So it sounds like, you know, with and that factors in all the costs, right, like, like management, you know, also, uh, projected, you know, whatever cost it takes to maintain a property and, you know, everything that goes into it, right? So net net, I think 15 to 18, uh, having a property manager that handles everything, um, you know, so far it's going pretty well, I would say. It's, you know, it's better than letting the money sit in the bank account, right? But um, so I'll continue to buy as long as, you know, the number makes sense, but it's just really hard to find one of those deals. Like sometimes I might find two, three deals within a given month, but sometimes it might, I might not find anything, you know, in, in a quarter. So that's kind of like a little bit hit or miss, but you know, as long as you stick with those numbers and it works out then you know, continue to do what you do, right? It's better than letting your money sit. Yeah, I think uh, 15 to 18 is great on long-term rentals. So good job. Christian, I don't think we've heard from you. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Hey, everyone. Uh, I was invited by Amy. Uh, I go by Ian. I actually am sick right now, but uh, happy to join on, listen to, to everything that you guys are talking about. This has all been uh, super helpful. Wow, 15 to 18% for LTR. Um, that is definitely a good goal for cash on cash for people to go for. Yeah, I mean, with the market changing, I'm currently in the middle of certain deals right now. And I'm, I'm in the middle of a commercial deal and these rates uh, being at 6% kind of kill things, right? And it's my first commercial deal, it's out of state. And uh, that definitely changes the way I think about things because the cash on cash return becomes much lower at a, at a lower, uh, at a higher interest rate. Separately, my mom is undergoing a 1031, and she's also doing a commercial deal. She's uh, pivoting out of her single family home into a uh, commercial property over in Santa Clara. So I know you guys were talking about Sunnyvale earlier, but there's a, a five unit that we got into. And uh, she got in with FRB, and that's a 4.1% interest rate. So we're kind of trying to maximize that cheap capital. So uh, with interest rates going up, in the places where we can still continue to get cheap leverage, we will. But then, you know... The, the deal that I'm trying to do out of state at 6% is totally crushed uh, just because of that, that interest rate. I think we'll still do it because it, it, it still gets a good return and we can still bump the rents up and, and things like that. It still has a lot of upside, but um, it's kind of, uh, you know, if I were to start from scratch looking at new deals, I mean, my expectations are much different. I have to be a lot more picky with the deals that I try to make because, I mean, um, yeah, it's just, you know, if the market is shifting, you kind of want to wait and see for a little bit. What's the strategy with the commercial property? Um, so I'm 
I'm doing one on behalf of my mom and then one for myself. So with my mom, basically we thought it was a great time with the market being hot recently. She actually sold her single family home um, back in March, which was pretty much the peak time to sell. And then she did a, a 1031. And um, what she's doing there, she actually, her replacement property is actually at a lower price because we were being a little bit conservative. It's at a lower price than the purchase that, than the, the price of the house that she sold. Uh, so she sold a single family home and then she bought a five unit over in Santa Clara and the price was actually less than the, the house that she sold, um, which is technically that's subject to, um, to a partial gain, but what we're gonna do is an improvement exchange and we're gonna add an ADU to the back. And that's gonna add additional um, rental income. And when you value the, uh, the property, once you add the ADU, I mean, it adds a ton of value to the property. So it had, I mean, our criteria was basically just location, it being in a good area with high rents and then being having a good lot size to be able to add an ADU and do it all within the exchange using a, a build to suit exchange. So. It's a, a different kind of 1031 exchange where the 1031 uh, exchange agent has to form an LLC for you. Uh, you can't take title to the property. So they ha actually, um, they form this EAT, like this, this separate entity and they hold the uh, title to the property while you make all of your improvements. And then at the very end of the, the transaction all still has to be within 180 days. Then they, they go ahead and, and um, um, transfer title to you. So we're doing that improvement exchange to add the ADU and then, and then from there, it should just be getting cash flow. And it's, I mean, we could have obviously gone much bigger going out of state, but since this is for my mom, we wanted something close to home. Uh, we wanted something that gets a lot more rental income than obviously a single family home. Single family home was getting 4,500 in rental income. Now it'll be 14,000, you know, 15,000, you know, so it'll be a lot better um, now. Um, so that was the strategy there. Awesome. Thank you for sharing all of that. Seems like there's a lively discussion on the chat on where's the best locations to invest. Does everyone want to shoot out what they think is the most promising areas? I know Wakefield, you're focused on Ohio. Tracy, are you looking outside of the Smoky Mountains? Are you going to add any areas to your roster? Um, I'm currently looking around the Dallas area. So Texas, it's more of a personal choice because I just love the area. And I figured if I have a vacation home, might as well just find something there. Um, but right now, yeah, mainly Dallas. Um, I've been going back and forth with a beach market, but I just don't think I have an appetite for like three month vacancy because there's always like a down season in the winter. Um, but I mean, if I practice what I'm preaching, I could always midterm rental that out for those months and then short term rental the rest. But yeah, just right now, Texas. Awesome. And uh, how about Will and the magical long term rental numbers for a single family? Um, I mean, I have been buying properties in Pennsylvania and Michigan, um, not Detroit specifically, but then there are surrounding cities in Metro Detroit um, that still offer quite good, um, you know, high cash on cash return. So check out those areas. You'd be surprised what you can find. Well, I have a question. Have you experienced any challenges with those high cash on cash uh, tenants, because typically you have a high cash on cash return, but it usually means that your tenant quality tends to go down. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, have a, I have a really good realtor um, in the area, so he knows the area really well. Um, I know that, you know, specifically, you know, you kind of mentioned Detroit, right? There's a lot of really bad tenants with terrible credit scores. Um, in Detroit, and they would do more damage to your property than, than, um, than you could actually gain from it, right? So at the end of the day, you know, you're actually buying your way into troubles. Um, first, it's like there are some surrounding cities that are actually okay, right? Like, you know, for instance, like Royal Oaks has pretty good school district. It depends on when you get in um, as well, right? Because the property values have actually gone up a lot in the area as well. Um, you know, Warren, it depends on, you know, where you're looking, right? North of 9th, it's typically a pretty, 
decent area with like less crime, better, slightly better tenants. You know, you have Roosevelt, you have, um, you have uh, also, let me see, sorry, there's a couple of different areas. Basically, there's a couple of diff like really good cities around the area and specific areas within Warren, like a lot of the, you know, better tenants in Detroit are actually moving up north, right, or moving west. So um, I haven't personally had any issues with uh, any of my tenants so far, knock on wood. Um, but I mean, they, I mean, they seem to do pretty well. And the properties that I bought have already gone up a lot in value um, within the past year and a half. So, so it's a little bit of both. Like I was kind of surprised to get the appreciation. I guess it's like the effect of the inflation in general. Um, and then with the cash on cash return, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite nice, you know, to be able to get a little bit of both. That's, that's really helpful. As a follow-up question, so it seems like you invest in a lot of high cash on cash markets. Um, have you considered switching that over to a more high appreciating market? Yeah, I have been, yeah, that's a really good question. I've been thinking about it, um, but because like I was feeling, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's a bad word, right, to use because it's not very logical, um, but, you know, I was sort of preparing, right, for some sort of recession to come as I start seeing interest rates to continue to climb up. So that's why I haven't been focusing on um, high appreciating area because I know that there will be a downturn before another upturn. So um, right now, I would probably stay away from what I assume the, the, the high appreciating areas are. Like, for instance, I would love to uh, buy properties in Austin, right? Because I know that that's an upcoming area. Um, but at the same time, you know, when you, when you do the math on your projection of some of those property, you'll probably lose money today trying to rent out a property at the price that you pay for it. So, um, so I, I'm thinking about waiting out just to see how the interest rate would further impact the price and see if the numbers would improve over time. Um, and then I'll try to get back into the more high appreciating market. And plus I live in the Bay Area, right? So I already have, you know, one gamble on the house <laughs> that I'm living in. So um, I, I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay put for a little while before, you know, looking back into those areas where are more desirable and more high, high, you know, with higher appreciation. Yeah, but I would love to hear, you know, what, what, what do you guys think as well? Annie, are you focused on Texas? Are you going outside? Right now, I'm mostly in Texas, but I also did um, something in Atlanta. But um, what I'm doing right now, because this I'm running a little bit low on cash to keep buying all individual properties myself. And I feel that potentially if I partner with people to buy larger things, I can get a better deal. Um, so mostly this year, I've been focusing only on syndication stuff. Like um, what I did was an industrial cement factory. And then I did a multifamily ad in Houston. And then I'm also investing in um, something in, H oh, in Austin with Nelson. And so it's, uh, it's got new development in an apartment building. Um, and then also through fractional. So last month, a group of us, we, there's actually a group of 40 of us who combined our money to take down 11 duplexes together in a nice part of, um, of Atlanta. And I'm, sometimes I, I look at stuff with Stella and I see that she's also been getting um, a lot really more negotiation power with the larger, um, like the larger portfolio purchases. So I think I might be going toward that route and getting a little piece rather than like try to take down one single family home by myself. Got it. That makes sense. You got to work where your advantages are. How about uh, Irwin? Which STR markets are you in? And are you uh, still looking? Uh, mainly just uh, here in Cal uh, LA, man. So uh, I have Long Beach, Burbank, and Whittier. Um, for me, it's pretty easy to expand uh, in Long Beach, just because I have, I've made the connections to, uh, to developers and anytime there's a vacancy, I can just pick it up if I want to. And if the numbers make sense to me, um, I'd say like, personally, I'm looking in right now, looking at Vegas, Texas, Indy, and Florida um, as possible. So I do like 
I do like Houston and I do like Indianapolis as a, a good midterm play. Um, the other two markets are kind of like, you know, yeah, everybody knows those two other two markets, what they're for, you know. So um, that's what I'm, I'm looking at right now. <laughs> yes, definitely get caught invest in uh, Texas or North Carolina early. Always good to have <laughs> insights before everyone else. What uh, locations are you most interested in? in yeah, so I do like uh, a few answers ago, somebody mentioned that uh, they're looking for cash flow markets because they have a big bet in the Bay Area just living it here, right? So, I mean, me, I just um, separately, we also bought a duplex here. So we're, we're renting out the other side of our home here. Uh, that is kind of our appreciation play. As far as my cash flow play, um, I like Cincinnati. I like Ohio. And that's mainly because I know the market. Um, I know Wakefield invests in that market as well. And then um, we have some other Ohio investors in here and Tracy invests in Cleveland. But that's that's a market that I know uh, pretty well and that I I like as well. It has its, it has its pros and cons of the property taxes are high. Um, the property that I'm looking at has a pretty high expense ratio. Everyone's complaining about the, the gas bill and, and things like that. But um, the cash flow is really good and the rents are, are pretty high. The, con considering, um, you know, Cincinnati, I think they said uh, it, was, it was on like the Colbert Report or something like that. They were talking about the places with the highest rent increases. And uh, Cincinnati was top four along with, um, you know, the other, the other ones that you would have expected. So that's one that I'm looking at. Got it. Thanks for sharing, everyone. Um, all right. So we're coming up on an hour and a half. I think we've had a wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed this time with you all. Do we have any last items anyone wants to discuss? Yeah, yeah. I, I sort of have a question. Um, so I, I guess a lot of you are also live in the Bay, like myself. Um, I guess one, one problem is that, you know, real estate is expensive here and uh, I, I don't know if this applies to you guys as well, but for me, my debt to income ratio is not great because of this. So I was looking maybe into using a DSCR loan to acquire a short-term rental, but I, I, I have, um, don't have any experience with this and just seeing if there was any advice that anybody here would be willing to give me. I'm interested in hearing people's responses because the rates on those things are seven and a half or eight percent whenever I've been asking but I'm sure other people have done them what is it what is that the SCR loan again pretty much the income of the you get qualified by the income of the property and not based on your own debt to income ratio oh I see like so, uh, not not QM loan yeah yeah, yeah and it yeah what was the last time you got a quote from those guys uh, for a DSCR loan, that was probably within a month ago. So it's approaching what, like seven right now? The quote that I got uh, like within a month ago was seven and a half percent, but eight percent in Ohio because they were saying it's a no prepayment penalty state, which I've later heard is not true. But um, I didn't do too much research on that because I, I ended up pursuing a commercial deal, which has completely different terms and had lower rates as well. But um that was that was the last i heard and i was shopping around with a few dscr lenders one of them being the one brokerage which is david green's team um but i i didn't do too much research i kind of pivoted right when i right when i saw eight percent so would like to hear what other people have have been quoted yeah, yeah they, just no go, go ahead. ahead uh yeah i just i'll just add to what ian said it, it sounds like you know, we know the same brokerage. I've talked with one of the guys there. Um, and I just got a quote back today that is low 7%. Um, so the the rates are pretty high, even even when we quoted with them, I would say like three to four, three to five months ago, they were maybe like five or six, but they're probably like a hundred point a uh, hundred points higher than like a regular standard, you know, conforming loan. Um there's, there's pros and cons to it. So the pros are if you, uh, you know, don't want this on your personal credit or, you know, it's harder to qualify, then you can basically get almost 
I think there's no limit on the number of loans you can get with with a non-QM, just DSCR loan, as long as your property underwrites, they run the numbers and it works. Um, but the con is that it's, um, you know, the rates, the rates are high. Um, so that's that's kind of the thing. And then, um, yeah, I think Ian's other point that I mentioned too, is there's prepayment. It's, I don't know, we're, we're in the same market like Ohio, Cincinnati, and supposedly there's no prepayment, but so they'll basically build in a higher rate uh, so they can get that profit in a different way. Um, but if you do have a prepayment, then they'll usually lock you in. I think it's three, four, five years. There's there's like different terms and you can, you know, you can pay a higher rate and a more flexible prepay. Um, so those are those are some options. And at, at the rate is low lower if you do four units or under, which would be considered uh, residential. But if you go above four units and that, that breaks into commercial space and then um you know rates might be higher and they might have to to run more um you know numbers on it to qualify how about specifically some ian right asked about investing in the bay how about like wait until like everything calm calm down first so at like seven percent is still you know worthy you know, right now the prices and interest rates just doesn't make sense. <laughs> I agree. You just need to buy where Will's buying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think kind of going back to like Will's point too, and it's funny because I've been thinking about this for this past week where it's like, hey, like, does it make sense to sit on the sidelines right now because interest rates are so high? But then it's kind of like we really can't get our cake and we eat it, right? Where it's like if interest rates are low and then the home price is also low, everybody's going to be jumping on it. So you just got to pick one or the like one or the other. And then there, and then I think that's where like exit strategies comes into place where like for Will's point, it's, you know, maybe now instead of doing a 30, a 30 year, he's doing an arm and then eventually you could refinance it. And I think the most important question for me when I'm looking at a deal is it's like, how bad do I want this? And do I want to lose it over a couple of points for an interest rate? Or can I acquire it at a higher interest rate putting down more down payment, but I can eventually refinance it, but I have this growing asset that I can potentially do like a cost segregation and I can do all these tax benefits too. Um, so I think kind of like TLDR is like, what is kind of the benefit of acquiring this now from like a tax perspective and appreciation? And is it really worth sitting on the sidelines or is it worth jumping in now and just kind of getting in and then when the interest rate does go low, you get the benefit of the appreciation and just refinance it. Um, I think sitting on sideline is better in this case because um, property tax is going to be lower. We get a lower entry point and it's going to go down. There's no no doubt about that. I'm talking about the Bay, so I'm not sure about anything. I'm not speaking for like Ohio or something. Like, And, and I agree, like you can always refinance. Even though it's low, the interest rate is high, just grab it and use an arm and wait until three years later when the market's down, it's going to be quantitative easing, uh, again. Um, so then, um, you can refinance then. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I feel like the Bay is like a whole other beast in itself. Like I was just looking at homes in San Jose the other day, just for kicks. And it's like a shack is still 1.5 million. Like in that case, I don't care what the benefit is. I can't do it, but it's speaking more so of like broadly other properties elsewhere. <laughs> you can Airbnb all day and still get hurt, you know? <laughs> Well, the thing is, in like the Bay Area, it's so strict to even Airbnb. Like a lot of the ones here in the Bay Area is actually illegal. People just do it. But yeah, exactly. You're like one call away from like a, like a, I don't know, like the city coming over and doing it. <laughs> I know. Right? I'm trying to take my rice bowl. Just trying to eat over here. Yeah, if you think the, the prices in the Bay Area are going to go down, I would wait it out a little bit or or start putting in offers right now to what you think they will be. But um, I would be looking, since interest rates are going up, I really like First Republic Bank. And uh, I'm not sure if, you know, uh, I would try to use their Eagle program. I don't know if those are the areas that you like. Maybe, maybe they aren't. But um, if you can find the perfect area that still meets that moderate income census tract uh, and you can still lock in, you know, a 3.25% interest rate, I mean, that's a win right there. Um, 
in in this environment, obviously. And and they they price their loans. Um, doesn't matter even if it's a duplex to four units. They price it like a single family home. That's how I got my I got my duplex at three point one percent. But most other people they they have pricing for single family homes, and then the, the two to four units they get priced really really high. So um, yeah, that's just one little insight. Uh, Wakefield, hey, yeah. I have a question. quick question. Yeah. Actually, I have a quick question for you. Um, is there a way that you can look at their uh, map for the Eagle Loan Program? Because I remember yeah, trying yeah. to ask them you and can. they said they didn't have it. They, they don't want to share that, but I was annoying enough to get it from them. Um, I can send that to you. That would be fantastic because I don't want to keep on type. asking them. Yeah, I'll type it in this chat. Um, in the meantime, I actually have a question as well. Uh, so for Wakefield, this is about a Cincy deal that I'm doing. It's a small commercial deal. Um, so first of all, I've had issues talking to lenders over in Cincinnati, just being out of state. I was just wondering if you have any issues um, being out of state. And then number two, I was offered for a commercial loan. I was offered an arm, which I'm not I'm not afraid of arms, but it was an arm with 12 month repricing. And that kind of scared me because I don't know where rates will be in 12 months. So what are your thoughts on that? It was, it, so the rate uh, to, to make it more specific um, on a commercial loan, the rate would have been 6%, but with 12 month repricing, I think it was 5.2%. Um, and I was like, I don't want to touch a 12 month arm personally, but I don't know. Yeah. So, so your first question is, uh, I mean, short answer, yes. We've we've been in that market for what six, seven years now, and uh, I actually was not really expecting lending to be as much of a challenge as it is. You know, we're in California and thought, okay, we're just going to go to another state and banks work the same way. Uh, actually, not the case. So there are lenders that will only lend to you if you are. Um, you know, your residence is actually in that state, at least Ohio. I'm not, I'm not sure about other states. Um, and I think the reason for that is just legal protections. They're afraid of, you know, having to go after people for recourse loans, um, things like that. Um, yeah. So for your loan, um, you know, I, I, federal funds rate right now is like, you know, one and a half percent, one, one and three quarters. And it's expecting to go up, I think, to three or three point four by end of this year. So you're probably expecting like another hundred fifty points, two hundred points. So um, you know, and and if your rate there is, if you're trying to lock in a rate now and uh, keep it for a little bit longer, that's you know probably something to keep in mind. Um, I I'd probably go with the. Uh, a longer term arm. So far, our, our deals have been financed with uh, five year arms. And we've, you know, unfortunately been caught with some of the, the rate increases, even like, you know, we missed the window by two weeks and the rate bumped 50 points, unfortunately, um, just did another one like that. So um, I think the shortest term one that we're doing right now is like a three year arm. Uh, nobody exactly knows what's what's going to happen with rates. But some people are saying that rates are going to come back down in 2024 like you know post recession or whatever whatever you know something happens um so yeah that's that's something to to consider uh and then you know i think i think kind of like to will's point earlier is if you like you run your numbers and you know maybe you you plan if, if you do want to do the short term one if you you know if it goes up by a point um, you know, what happens to your numbers? Do they still work? Um, or, you know, do you pay, you pay higher if it's a spread of like 25, 50 points or even hundred points higher to, to fix it for another two to five years, just, you know, um, you can kind of just compare, compare what it looks like, but, um, I might, I might have some lenders for you also. I'm not sure who you're talking with, but, um, you know, if it's helpful, uh, we can, can connect on that. Yeah. Thanks. I uh, appreciate all the insight. I'll, I'll send you a message after. I think we've all learned a ton from each other today. It's been really great. Do we have any final comments? No, I just want to say thank you, everyone, you know, for sharing your knowledge. I feel like I definitely learned a lot, um, especially around areas where I, you know, have been really interested in learning more. Like I was able to get some additional insights from this group. So 
appreciate you all. <clears throat> Fantastic. Likewise, thank you so much, Sam, for moderating and for the questions too. These are awesome. Thank you everyone for yeah. joining. Thank you, Trace. You know, thank you everyone for sharing so much of your strategy and thoughts. I think it was very helpful. Thank you, Sam, for putting this together. It's awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to stay up to date with us in the future, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, visit our website, and join our Facebook group.